Now, good afternoon and uh, welcome once again to the Maniac Talks today. We are very pleased to have uh, one of our colleagues, an old time colleague, uh, Steve Nanga, who has been with NASA for more than 45 years in the county. So, quite a long time indeed. So, he's got a long story to tell. Uh, and to summarize this story, I wanted to uh, tell you a very short story <coughs> uh, about a hare and a turtle. You know, people know a hare and a turtle. A hare is known as cunning, and a turtle is famous for being very slow. So the hare used to mock the, uh, the turtle all the time. The, you guys were very slow. Why don't you try to move a little bit faster? And then the, the turtle decides to challenge uh, the hare uh, to a marathon, half marathon. And then they go on to their marks. You know, you're just coming from the Olympics, so you can imagine this lace between the hair and the turtle. So they go to the starting point, and they start the race. And they invited all the animals to come, because this was going to be an epic battle. So invite all the animals uh, to come witness uh, this uh, given lace. Early in the morning, the king of the jungle, the lion, starts the race, and off they go. And you can imagine, of course, there is no competition here. And the hare is moving at almost 50 kilometers an hour, and the turtle is you know, just trotting along with the heads high at 10 kilometers an hour. So no competition, obviously. And they keep moving and moving. At some point, the hare looks back. He can't see the, the turtle. And he decides to take a small short break under a tree. Unfortunately, goes to sleep. <laughs> By the time he woke up, it was too late. The turtle had just come and passed and went all the way to the finish line. And everybody was surprised. Where is the hair? You know? So he lost the list. So the moral, the moral of this story, some of you may know about it, is obviously it's always nice to be steady. You know, steady and sure and always going on. Don't be like the hair who thinks that this is a won competition, so I don't need to do anything, and he lost. So no one understands this lesson better than Steve. Steve, having been here for 45 years, <laughs> knows the value of, of steadily moving along. And he has headed many projects, including being the, uh, the project scientist for the Earth Observing Satellite and many other things. Uh, he's going to walk with us uh, that journey, and he has done so many other things, including he was just telling me a few minutes ago that he is even a president of a synagogue, a very important role. So he has so many dimensions, there are so many dimensions to his career, and I can't wait uh, to hear his story. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our speaker, Stephen Younger. Thank you, Sean. That's an interesting story, and I think the turtle is very admirable, but I'm not quite sure whether I'm the turtle or the hare. <laughs> because I have been accused of being a bit impetuous and running ahead and not always finishing. Uh, but at any rate, uh, 45 years is, I think, an understatement that's uh, now exceeding 50, but that's, that's OK, too, as you will see. Now, I haven't particularly rehearsed this. I'm a little bit jet lagged. That probably will help things go more smoothly. But I'm not going to talk about what you might think I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I'm going to take a cue from you as to exactly what I'm going to do. And hi, Bob. <laughs> Good to see you. I had a picture f with you in this presentation, but I've taken all those pictures out. <laughs> okay. It's not too incriminating. Okay. <laughs> and I deliberately titled this in a way that I thought was appropriate because, in fact, I was slow. Uh, I was slow in developing. I had uh, some uh, issues as a child. Uh, they have names for these things now, and I don't know if they're true or not true, but then the expression was, you're slow. Uh, your kid has an IQ that doesn't reach 100, okay? Uh, your kid is cockeyed. That was the expression then for people who had amblyopia and, and, and other, other situations. Uh, and I was very, very introverted in spite of uh, that showman appearance, okay? And I was a little bit weird. Even back then, I was fascinated with the notion of what existed and what the world was. And my worldview was a little bit influenced uh, 
by what would have been mistaken by others for retardation. I came from very, very, very humongous family, very, very large. And not because I had a lot of siblings. I had a reasonable number. I had two brothers. And I'm the youngest. And I'm complaining about being 78 and going on to reaching 80. And my brother, who's 12 and a half years older than me, says, stop belly aching. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you'll, see, you'll see, I think I do have one or two pictures in there uh, if I've left them in. And then I have another brother who's uh, eight and a half years older than I am. And they're, they're both mobile and fully functional. And I have to say that uh, if I have problems remembering a name, I just ask my oldest brother and he, and he comes up with it immediately. So for better or worse, I have to be prepared to continue my journey for several more years, likely. Okay. Now, why was the family humongous? Because my mother was one of seven sisters. And you don't have to talk about the uh, women's roles. In those days, it was called women's libs. Uh, my aunts were liberated, <laughs> no question about it. Uh, and they, they, they ruled the house. And I have many uh, fond memories of, uh, of, of the Bronx. And you, you'll see someone else in this who, who you'll know who has very similar memories, who's very, very culturally apparently different than me, uh, being brought up in the South Bronx. Uh, and we'll move on here. My life was basically symbolized by my heroes. Okay? And they seem to be very different. Uh, and I try and analyze now. I, I do have a keen recollection of being very, very fond and following on the radio, Superman, and Gene Autry, even the theme song, and very recently, I actually reverted back at uh, our Hispory conference. I joined the Gene Autry Museum, which is out in, near Pasadena. Uh, and I can still sing a song. And then this guy, who, who I had the good fortune of meeting once, was a big influence. Well, why Autry? Okay. Uh, it really goes down to him. Um, unusual for the times, because we're now going back to, I was born in 37, we're going back to a time where racial tolerance didn't exist. Uh, certainly there were an enormous amount of prejudice in the South Bronx and a little bit of clustering, but there was a tremendous amount of tolerance because everybody had to live together. Uh, lots of immigrants, immigrants and so on. And you'll see, you'll see something in a moment that will reinforce that. Uh, I like this particular uh, one here, which was out of time. Uh, he must not advocate or possess racially or religiously intolerant ideas. That was pretty unusual okay, in, in, in that time and era. And so I associated with all these people in, on, on the streets of the South Bronx, so it, it, it rang home. Uh, the one I had a, a little bit of trouble with is number three. So I modified a little bit. <laughs> okay, I went to PS39 in the Bronx. It did not look quite like this then, uh, and it certainly a decade later was uh, the whole neighborhood was in shambles. And it's now called Banana Kelly High School. Now, Banana Kelly is not a person. Banana Kelly is a street, Kelly Street. Okay, and it's shaped like a banana when it passes near the school. And it's an area that's been very fondly referred to as the playground of someone else who was born in 1937, just a few months before me. He was born in April. I was born December 31st, 1937, which really thrilled my father. He got a break for the entire year in terms of income tax. Uh, he got an another deduction. Uh, th this chap name was Colin Powell. So among the uh, many people I went to school with, there's the South Bronx. And Colin wrote this. I'll let you read this as, as I'm talking. Okay. I shared his experience, and it's interesting. He comes from a different cultural background. But again, uh, I don't know if it's actually in this one. No, it, it's not. I encourage you to go retrieve this article if you can, because he talks of having a very large family, of the influence of the family, of, uh, of, of 
they were not sufficient to keep him on the right path, but they were necessary. Uh, and his appreciation for what was to come. I took a track that was very similar to him. I went to PS39, but he went on to Thomas Knowlton Junior High School. It's, it's not in his article. I just know that he, he did. And my brothers did as well. Uh, and junior high school in those days consisted of seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. So people then went to high school only for three years. Uh, they, they entered as a sophomore. Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, my mother chose to send me on a long walk up Southern Boulevard toward Hunts Point through Fort Apache to Bronx to go to a place called PS 75 because my grammar school, PS 39, only went up to the sixth grade. So I needed the seventh and eighth grade. And, and, and that, that had a big influence in my life uh, through uh, uh, Mrs. Callenson was her name. She was my math teacher. Uh, I, I could barely draw, read, write, and everything, but uh, I, I was initially chastised for doing long division in my own way. And much to my surprise, my youngest daughter, who was slightly handicapped, was also chastised after we moved to suburbia because she had a, a different way of looking at things than the standard script. Okay. But at any rate, uh, we both ended up at City College. And he was very noticeable because he was this very tall, slender, you know, black, lightly skinned black cadet in the ROTC. Very friendly chap. He's also a member of the City College Alumni Association down here in Washington and occasionally attends meetings. So we both got a tremendous education. We're going to be moving on to that. There were three schools in the city that were oriented towards science. The, 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 the education system in New York City at that point was unbelievably excellent. I don't know why, I don't know how it can be replicated, I don't know why it hasn't spread everywhere. Else. But it had specialty schools for whatever you wanted to be, music and art, performing arts, Bronx High School of Science, Stuyvesant High School, which I thought was the best, clearly. Okay. Uh, um, and it was the uh, only, you know, I think science may have been a little bit harder to get into. My uh, middle brother went to science and my oldest brother went to Stuyvesant. But it was kind of a junior macho school because it was into athletics and sports. And we played football against a team that was uh, also from a, a high school that was an old boys high school way in the Bronx. We were all the way downtown. That was DeWitt Clinton High School, which we refer to as Dimwit Clinton. And I must say that another city college uh, contemporary with me, Dan Golden, went to Dimwit Clinton High School, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, but he was a very, very bright guy, so don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Stuyvesant was very unusual. I actually applied, and initially, my brothers were telling my mother to lay off of Steve, you know, this, because they, they understood that I had some limited potential up until that point. And they actually came down and you know, spoke to and were advocating for me with the teachers and so on. But at any rate, I found through Mrs. Callenson, uh, my, my interest in math, she was very, very encouraging. And she did encourage me to take the entrance exam to Stuyvesant. And I remember when they announced who had gotten in, and she read the list. And my name was not on the list. And I said, oh, OK kind of accepted that, and so, and then she said, oh, Steve, you're, you, you got in, okay? I, I, you know, didn't believe it, and I was dumbfounded, um, but that was a great opportunity, uh, and, and that set me on, on the uh, right track, because Stuyvesant was very unusual, had a long history, uh, longer than any of the other schools that I mentioned. The Brooklyn Tech was the third one, Bronx High School of Science, Brooklyn Technical School, and Stuyvesant, uh, always vying academically. It had two sessions, and that happened and, uh, for many, many years because it was so popular that they had the AMers and the PMers. And of course, when you were in the first two years, you were an AMer, had to get up early. So I would get up early at the age of 12, 13, and take the subway way down to Manhattan, uh, and then walk from Union Square over to the school day after day, no lunch period. Uh, you could, if you were really starving after the class was over, go across the street to a kind of a sub-sandwich 
place, who was uh, nicknamed Tomain Joes, but that's another story. Uh, but there, there were an interesting group of people there that I met. These were all people who were oddball. I was no longer quite as strange as I thought I was. Uh, or perhaps I just joined the company of others who were just as strange. It was all boys. Okay? It was very, very interesting. And we were paired with a high school called Julia Richmond. But nobody ever bothered to get uh, over to Julia Richmond and so on. So to be quite candid, most of the guys there were at the stage where they were th even a senior where they were thinking about girls, but they weren't interacting with girls. Okay. And I do remember an incident with a guy who was uh, dead set on converting everyone. I think his, name, his first name was Harold. I remember that distinctly because my, my oldest brother's nickname was Harold. That was truly his middle name. And he would keep coming up and trying to convert me, okay, uh, frankly. And went on and on and on endlessly. And so one day I remember saying to him, much to the applause of everyone around me, Harold, you know, you're here, so do you save girls? And he said, yes, sure. So well, save me a couple for next Saturday night. <laughs> but uh, that was the degree of our um, interaction and, and, and sophistication with the fair sex. But there was lots of shop and gym and other, you know, what they would call manly pursuits because science had already become co-ed, and Brooklyn Tech, I'm not quite sure. That was over in a different bar away, far away. Anyway, I, I'm not sure whether they were. I think they were also all boys. But uh, they were very, very much into this. They were into science, but they were also into climbing ropes, which I was not very uh, adept at, uh, and swimming. They had a pool in the school, and competitive pool. I, I did manage to get a junior lifesavers uh, thing and, and was able to serve as a lifeguard one summer. Uh, and, and that was big. And also football. Science certainly didn't have a football team. And we had our annual game on a place called Randall's Island, which was in between Queens, the Bronx, and Manhattan, out, uh, not, not far from another famous island called Rikers Island, which is close by where the prison was. And we'd walk across the Triborough Bridge to attend the annual Thanksgiving Day game. And, and then uh, it, it was a tremendous rivalry with a, a lot of, uh, I guess, mental uh, hostility. <laughs> I, I don't think we ever really scrapped with, with the uh, Clinton guys. And I think if we did, we probably would have gotten severely pounded. But we were noisy about it. Okay. Now, this was important because it served as my entry into something called the Junior Astronomy Club. Okay. This had been around from the 30s and was formed by some people who had uh, tremendous science interests. In those days, astronomy was supported by uh, volunteers and amateurs. Amateur astronomers knew almost as much as the professionals. They didn't have the ability to have uh, photometers attached to their telescopes. So they had organizations. One was called the AAVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And Margaret Mayo up in Cambridge, Mass. It's funny, I can't remember half the names of people I've met today, but I, this all comes back to me. And you would go, on, go out and you'd look at a star and you'd write down your estimate of the magnitude. You'd use binoculars. And they had this down, they really had it down to a science because they calibrated individuals. They understood you know, that this guy would typically be a half magnitude lower in estimation than that guy. And they had rules and regulations and uh, comparison stars. So that was one of them. And the other was the uh, AMS. Okay. No, not the Meteorological Society. It's the American Meteor Society. Okay. And what we would do is the guys in the JSC um, would go up to Woodlawn Cemetery. You probably see that there on the map. At the end of the, uh, uh, the subway line in the Bronx, and practically walk into Yonkers, and there was a golf course there, actually, the Mishula Golf Course. And we'd find a place, and, and you'd lie down, and you'd lie down. So somebody was looking at Zenith. And then if you had five guys, you'd each take quadrants, north, south, east, west. 
But ideally, you really wanted nine guys. And, well, be, yeah, and you would look at northeast, southwest, and you'd be looking at that segment of the sky, and you'd stay there for endless hours under the presumption that at some point a meteor would show up, and you'd record it and where it was. And then that would all get bundled up and sent over to you know, the, the headquarters there. Yeah. So, so that was very, very important stuff. And that, uh, was in the, uh, you know, some, somewhere is between uh, 51 and 55. Uh, let's see, sleepless nights. Ah, the other thing was the Junior Astronomy Club met in Brooklyn. So I had this long, long trek from the Bronx to Brooklyn. Okay? Um, and I, at that point, I'm now, you know, approaching 16, 17, and I certainly don't have any interest in 12-year-old girls, okay? So my wife was a collator apparently, and I was the editor of the Junior Astronomy News. <laughs> and she remembers that vividly at that point. So uh, I, I was, uh, I, I'll explain when I uh, basically got back with my, uh, you know, recognize her as a person <laughs> other than just a stapler. Okay. Uh, oh yeah. At Stuyvesant, there was this very unusual guy, his name was Alexander Efron. Uh, he was the only person who's weirder than any of the other kids, and he was an adult. So uh, he taught physics in a very, very unusual way, and we actually dubbed the course Ephronics, and that caught my attention. Uh, and then finally, unfortunately, the guys at the Junior Astronomy Club, they were, they were geniuses, okay? I was not a genius. Okay. They pulled without hardly any studying at all 800s in their SATs. Okay, I, I, did, I didn't take an SAT, didn't have to. Fortunately, coming and being mainstream from stars and understanding that even if I got admitted to University of Michigan as Steve Marin, who was a, a big astronomer here for a number of years, now retired, uh, went to University of Michigan. He, he, he got a scholarship, but still, all of my cousins, and there were like 40 of them, and I said, we all went to City College. That was it. That was the same story that you read for General Powell over there. Okay, so uh, I felt a, you know, a little bit out of, of kilt, but they had big problems. We would do really strange things. We'd go to Times Square, and these are very diametrically different things. We, we would maybe go on to the radio as the young book reviewers, or we go to hear the musical concert, uh, that's WQXR, the audience. But we'd also go down to the village. That was a big thing in Play Go and uh, interact with the beatnik generation. And th that was really, uh, I met a whole cast of other characters. It was very eye-opening. And also wandering the streets of the South Bronx and Hunts Point area and areas like that made me very, very, very street savvy. Uh, City College in New York, gorgeous building, very gothic. And that's where I hung out, in that tower, South, South Tower. That's where the Astronomy Observatory was. Not much of an observatory, but it had instruments in the transects dating back to the 1700s because the, that's where it ended up, uh, the people who did some of their explorations and so on. Okay, so you got a better view of it and looking at the nice kind of gargoyles. Now, I did have street smarts, and if you don't believe it, maybe this will help you a little bit. Summers, I served as a Pinkerton guard. <laughs> when I, uh, the guys at the Junior Astronomy Club, you know, I said, oh, I'm a Pinkerton detective. And they said, no, you're a Stinkerton defective. Okay, but that's another story. <laughs> um, and I could really look cool, too. See, there I am. <laughs> Same place. I worked the uh, tennis courts at Forest Hills. I worked the jewelry show at the uh, Waldorf Astoria. I worked a number of different things. It was, uh, uh, peripherally involved with a, a visit by President Nixon to the Waldorf. Uh, I worked double shifts because I always felt I had to make a lot of money. And so I got, the, I had a room at the Waldorf somewhere uh, during, during the summer, but that would be because I'd worked two eight hour shifts. And so I didn't get to enjoy it. And uh, because of the time, I won't tell. There, there are many, many stories involved with what happened there in terms of good crops, crooked crops, uh, supervisors, uh, insurance fraud, and stuff like that. So I got a real dose of the real 
world. I also worked down in the garment district at a place called Rose Sweet Custom Jewelry, and you know, I had to work for the summer. I said, well, you're a college boy, right? You got to I think this may have been between high school and college. I said, no, no, I don't want to go to college. I want to put it all free. I, they, they have believed me, but uh, anyway, I was counting, uh, be, being very poor sighted, beads out and handing it to uh, Puerto Rican women who were basically assembling it into necklaces and stuff like that. And, uh, and another chap, and the chap happened to be black, okay, it was, uh, he was my guy. He was helping me with getting packages and so on. So I, I learned that a lot of people, that, that there's not necessarily a tight relationship between being educated and being smart, or being street savvy, or uh, and the difference between ignorance and stupidity became really apparent to me. I started early, and this was marginally involved with NASA, but not much. I don't know if any of you, how many here have heard of Project Moonwatch? Okay, one person, not an old person either. Okay, all right. What happened was the Russians sent up Sputnik, and there was this big flurry in, in the amateur astronomy community. And it was run by the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. That was my first contact with the Smithsonian. Some of my colleagues know that I've resumed the close contact with them. Uh, and so that was in 57, 58, during the IGY. And I was still in college at that point. And so that, that was the first kind of a recognition I received other than the stuff I got from the JAC. So, so that would pick, took a part of my life uh, then. Now, what about CCNY? I can't say enough. I mean, you saw what Powell said. These are Nobel laureates who probably wouldn't have gotten to go to a fancy graduate school if it weren't for their education in City College. And among these, Arno Penzias stands out because I actually met with him a number of years later, and I'll go into that when the time comes. But you'll also see, interestingly enough, Henry Kissinger, who didn't graduate. Okay. And he's not listed as, an, uh, as one of the alumni who has gotten the Nobel Prize because he didn't graduate. But it was a good reason. He, like my brother, my brother, Entered City College at the age of 16, finished by the age of 18, and went into the Army, was pulled in. Uh, Henry did not have an opportunity to do that. He was pulled out in the middle and drafted into the Army. He had come over from Germany. He was a refugee, got there. So, and, and he did some remarkable things that I'll be happy to tell you about privately. Uh, actually, when I learned about it, and that's just recently, I didn't know about this uh, until now, uh, was a, uh, he was a genius, really. He was very, very good at school. Very, he did, did well. He ended up going back to Harvard and getting his degrees. But his service in the Army as a private basically he took over a whole town in Germany because he spoke the language very fluently and uh, organized things very, very well. But there are other people who are noteworthy that should be, you know, some names here that I'd like to point out. Gothels, the name Gothels Bill uh, Bridge going between Staten Island and uh, New Jersey name for him. But he's a civil engineer who was responsible for getting the Panama Canal built in record time. So the two people you got to remember for the Panama Canal are Gothels and Reed. Reed was the one, of course, who uh, figured out what to do about the yellow fever, which was really a big problem for the people working there. Then there's this guy, who I know quite well, <laughs> who graduated a couple of years after I did, actually three, but, but he was there for a year longer than me, so what can I tell you? So uh, Dan Golden, he's the ninth and longest tenured administrator of NASA. And I met with him a whole bunch of times at both uh, at City College Alumni Association things and here where he shook his finger at me all the time. Okay. Uh, the reason why is that Hyperion on EO1, the, the uh, imaging spectrometer, was built by TRW. Uh, its predecessor was built under his watch. Uh, the hyperspectral, a lot of, I don't know exactly who coined the uh, word hyperspectral. People accredit uh, you, you, you know, Alex Getz for doing that. Uh, but Alex kind of denies that, and he says, at any rate, he doesn't like the term. Uh, but uh, 
they would say, you, Steve, you got to prove, you got to demonstrate that this thing does things that the other. I says, you know, no, no, Dan, <laughs> what I have to do is give an honest evaluation. If I can basically, with conviction, say it's no better or no worse, or it, I have to validate it and get, give my report. That's what I'm supposed to do. He said, yeah, well, you better demonstrate it. <laughs> so, so that's what happens when you've been around for over 50 years. You, you get to know all these, these folks. Okay, then the other one, Leonard Susskind. Lenny Susskind was a physicist who worked with string theory. And there again was Colin Powell. Grew up on Kelly Street, around the corner from where I lived on Tiffany Street. Very, very close to where I was born on Beck Street. All right, next stage. Columbia University, a lot of uh, my colleagues don't know about this, Office of Naval Research, Hudson Labs, uh, was employed fresh out of college as an, a, a basically an EE, but with a degree in physics, uh, and did sea duty. That's the Josiah Willard Gibbs, which was the largest oceanographic vessel in the world at that time. And this is a picture of the Gibbs, and it was a converted seaplane tender, destroyer escort hull. And you can see the markings here. This is in 44. This is my cabin. I should go back to show you where it was. This is where I would berth. We had very special treatment because it turns out it was a naval vessel, but civil service, uh, merchant marine crew. And we pulled sea duty. We did a lot of interesting things. Hudson Labs, what did I do with Hudson Labs in those years? Hudson Labs was into, and I can say it now, ASW, okay? It means anti-submarine warfare, okay? And what we did was largely acoustics that they did, look at sound propagation to get the acoustic signature of ships. And a lot of this stuff has been declassified. It, technology was used by NASA deep down in the ocean. For some of you ocean people, you, you probably know about the inversion layer and there's an acoustic waveguide, basically. And so what happens is there's a, 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 what we call the SOFAR then, it's a bomb that goes down and detonates, it's pressure detonated in, in that channel, and you can, by having different hydrophones in different locations, find out where it is. It's not quite triangulation, it's the intersection of hyperbolas, because you look at the difference in arrival times of the signal, and you can then locate where it is. But you also want to know the characteristics of it. It's, it's like a souped up sonar and so on. Now, I, I had very little to do with that other than being dragged out to sea and having to help some of those guys as they started out as a data tech. So the other thing I did was nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's a, basically, it involves aura fields and magnetic fields, and it actually takes the molecules in, in, in whatever it is that you place in the chamber, and it aligns them. And then you basically can look at the signal they're given off as it basically misaligns back to where it originally was in, in the, the original configurations. So, and this is something that's quite remarkable that I just discovered. I bring your attention to the fact that and I found my name on three papers I didn't know I was involved with. Okay. This one was received on 4 October 63 and published on August 12, 2006. <laughs> so don't bellyache about being delayed by a couple of months. <laughs> yeah, slow reviewer. I know why this happened. It was in the classified literature. You can read the words. Oh, it just shows that I was involved with the paper. Here, this is the abstract. Uh, this is the beta viscosity coefficient uh, in the alkali halide solution, seawater's alkali halide solution. Uh, we are interested in, in submarine signals, right? And knowing what, there's an acoustic signal. There can also be a chemical signal. Now, submarines have uh, all kinds of generators in them, and they're electrical, and they generate electric and magnetic fields, and they do leave a chemical imprint. And so we, we knew about that, okay? Uh, that, that was it. It was very, very interesting stuff. Okay? And we did all kinds of experiments. Uh, now, what does this have to do with being published now? Well, there's something called MRI, 
which people call magnetic radiation imagery or something, right? But it's not. It's really magnetic uh, resonance. resonance, exactly. But they call it, I've read three or four um, definitions, not definitions of it, that, so there's a lot of misconceptions. You, you're exactly right. It, it is uh, uh, magnetic resonance imagery, but it's uh, misidentified that way. So, you know, th that has some relevance in that field. That's, that's the main reason. Um, this was very noteworthy. This was to the same 12-year-old girl who I started dating, uh, who I dated very, very briefly when she was 16 for about a year. And then later on um, in, in 60, 61, th that time frame, uh, she called me actually. And so we, we started dating again. I, I really started out with computers. That's why I'm still involved with them. Uh, very, very early on as an electrical engineer, I wired something up because um, I had this t endless job of looking at something and then every so often it, with a clock going, pressing a button. And I said, this is ridiculous, okay? And so I actually stayed over time at Hudson Labs and developed a little circuit that uh, did do that and they called it the automatic Steve. And I said, okay, I can sit back and read the paper. No, they moved me on to do some other stuff that was more intense. And I ended up in uh, Fa uh, Bert Fabrican's uh, lab who did all these things and a guy named Sawyer who come over from Perkin Elmer and I did infrared spectroscopy. That's my first introduction. And you have to be very careful when you do infrared spectroscopy. It's done with uh, prisms and stuff, but they're salt basically. And so you have to have low, low humidity, t temperature controlled, and so on. So that, that's my first introduction there. And this, the other years that I spoke of with, with CCM were the most formative. I guess you may have seen that when you went there. Oh no, this is the most formative year, the most productive, not most productive, but definitely the most formative. Uh, because a part of it was not just my association with Hudson Labs, but then uh, getting married. Now, you may wonder how I could go cross country in uh, 1961 with a guy named Garfinkel. No, Garf, yeah, Garfinkel, not Garfunkel, uh, who I worked with and take off that length of time. Well, being put on the Josiah Willard Gibbs, you pull what's called sea duty. So you got 12 hours a day, seven days a week, period. And Columbia University had a policy of no overtime. So you had to take compensatory time. And you weren't permitted to volunteer, but you did, but you didn't necessarily have to talk, but it wasn't official. So we were able to work very intensively and take time off. And on that trip, I stopped by uh, Boulder where Susan was taking a, a summer course uh, and uh, um, you know, just spent yeah, basically just a few hours there. And then uh, we, we started dating pretty heavily thereafter and uh, quickly got married in 62. Uh, and again, I still had a lot of sea duty to work off. So we went on a six week honeymoon. This time, instead of driving through Boulder, we went through the Trans Canada Highway, which had only been partially completed right to British Columbia back then, with a mixture largely of camping out, tenting, and at one point staying in the Banff Springs Hotel where we really, really splurged uh, and were probably taken advantage of by the snooty maitre d'. But it was an interesting experience. Uh, now, we've been married now for 54 years, so let's date back a bit. Uh, then 63, we became Father Peter, May 4th, got married on June 11th. And I noticed people kind of mentally counting and they said, well, it was a late-term baby. You know? <laughs> so in those days, things like that were important to people for whatever reason. And I got my master's degree while at Hudson Labs, still working there. They permitted me to, uh, I think they may have paid for it, may have made an arrangement with Columbia. But I got it again at the city, at city College, not the City University, because they went up, they had a master's program in physics. And they had some fantastic, fabulous people, a guy named Zemansky from Sears and Zemansky. I don't know, anybody heard of Sears and Zemansky thermodynamics? Okay, yeah. Well, I took a reading course with Dr. Zemansky, and to this day I have in my drawer a set of crappy Edmund scientific diffraction uh, cufflinks that he gave me. <laughs> Appreciation, but 
there were some really marvelous people there. Okay, and Fabrican, and a guy named Frosch, Bob Frosch, who was head of the laboratory, encouraged me to go back to uh, get my PhD, because I needed the credentials. They said, I'm very promising, I'm learning a lot, but you just got to do it. Okay. All right. uh, but I wasn't interested in what they were interested in. I was primarily interested in astrophysics. All right, so in 64, I resumed my coursework. Uh, I left Hudson Labs. Big step, spoke to Susan. We had a child. I was a father. I was responsible for supporting a family. Make no mistakes about it. In 1964, the husband was responsible for supporting the family, period. Yeah. Not, not that wives weren't free or able or willing to work. It's just that the husband viewed that as an absolute responsibility. So we discussed it. We figured it. We planned it. Okay. So I got a teaching assistantship at City College that gave me all of uh, 3000 something dollars, which was fairly handsome in those days. Because when I got hired at Hudson Labs back in 59, I had a fairly decent salary. It was $4,800 a year. That was big money. Okay. By the time I left, I had $10,000 was my salary, which was a fantastic. You know, like a, you know. So we, we saved a lot, did a lot. That was thanks to a guy named Eugene and Bimbo, but that's another story. I will tell you about it. That you, you were supposed to, everybody was supposed to keep their salary secret. I will tell you about it. And, and Gene and I, because we decided that we weren't going to be envious of each other, but we were going to inform each other and then go indignantly to our supervisors and say, why aren't I making as much as Unger? <laughs> why aren't I making as much as in Bimbo? So we seesawed it up to that point, to the point I left. And I think we both were very worthwhile uh, to the labs. They appreciated us. Again, with this responsibility, I resumed my coursework with teaching assistantship. It's not easy to get a, uh, I didn't feel it at the time, to get a master's degree at night in, in physics at a reputable university and work full time. But uh, here I had to commit myself for the PhD because it would have been impossible. Um, but I still needed to get some more support. So one of the faculty, not the faculty, one of my fellow students was actually in charge of the physics department at Queensborough, going for his PhD at community college. Uh, and he said he needed some help. He needed somebody to teach the physics for poets course, which, which I did. So I would teach in the day at the city, and I would uh, at the, go over to Queensborough Community College in the evenings. By 67, well, in 66, we had a second child born, Lisa. She turned out to be special needs. She was extremely premature. At that time, she was like a, you know, a one pound something odd baby, which in those days was really miraculous. Uh, the pediatrician said she was a salvage baby, in a sense. Uh, it turns out that uh, she's doing, she's thriving. She had a master's degree in, uh, in computer science, has been working at Yorktown Heights, IBM Watson Labs. Uh, so she's, she's, she's thriving and doing well, but she required a lot of attention. It turns out that she was uh, severely hearing impaired, which we didn't realize until she was maybe three or four. And there were other th issues as well. Okay. Um, so she took a lot of attention and some money. So I'm still teaching a session one with a TA and uh, an adjunct professorship at uh, Queensborough. So I began, I finished my coursework, so I wasn't held to being there. So I went down the road to GISS, because NASA was supporting me uh, for, for my, th and I worked with a guy named Dick Stuthers, uh, and I needed to, a I added some dollars to that because they gave me a research assistantship. Well, I spoke to Harry Lustig, the chair of the department, I said, I know it's unusual, but here's the situation, I can do it. I will teach, I will meet my obligations there. I want to have, I want to keep my teaching assistantship. So uh, somehow, and I, I can't even believe it's me, uh, talk about the hare and the tortoise, okay? I'm not so sure that I didn't take on more than I should have. Uh, so these three things going, at that point we had moved to a place called temporarily to Rushdale Village in, out in Queens, Jamaica, Queens. And, 
somehow I got involved with the Volunteer Ambulance Corps <laughs> to my so-called spare time. So I really have my, and that was very useful because I was able to do things like when my uh, impaired daughter got ill, I was able to, uh, I was the oxygen guy because I know a little bit about gases and stuff. And um, so we got to the pediatrician and I said, I don't want her going to Queensboro community. She says, okay, here's what we do. So I set up an oxygen tent over her crib with the croup and stuff. And he came every single day to give her a gamma globulin which was generally not available, but I went to the medical supply place, got it, did all that stuff. So there's more to life than just science, although I think of myself primarily, and I self-identify as my uh, abstract says, as a physicist, because that's the way I like to view the world. I, I, and, I, and I know Albert Einstein did the same thing, my other hero, uh, where, uh, and I'm accused of, you know, not thinking straight. Okay because somebody will say that and I'll just say something that, that comes up. I don't, I don't quite understand why, but anyway. So I began preparation, got that, began stellar modeling of massive main sequence stars. My thesis was a joy eventually, because I started out doing what was called the Raleigh genes problem, which had to do with stellar formation. Okay. And my advisor, Dick Stothers, said, well, you try this. And I tried it for a year. I didn't get anywhere. And then Dick Sutherland says, well, you know what? I'm not too surprised. And I said, you're not? He said, well, really good people have been working on this for you know, a century. <laughs> he said, well, you, you know, you seem to have been pretty good. And I said, ah, but not good enough. Huh, for that. I said, give me something I can do, <laughs> which he did. Uh, and I spent many late nights at GIS in, in Harlem, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning, because that's when I could grab the computer. Otherwise, the other people there, Milt Halem was there, as the name. How many people here know who Milt Halem was? Okay, well, almost a third of the people, that's good. He was uh, head of the uh, meteorology program at one point and also a computer guru. He, he was an applied mathematician from Courant Institute. He was at GIS. Al Arking was at GIS. Ishtiak Rasul was at GIS. Steve Schneider was my roommate. I don't know if that means anything to you as a climate guy very infamous, uh, tragically died in 2010. Uh, then the John Mather, another, another young guy, worked with Pat Thaddeus in 72. He came to GIS. Uh, whatever became of him? Oh, I think he got a Nobel Prize. Okay. I, I, fit, I successfully defended my thesis in 70. I dropped my teaching assistantship at CCNY. Uh, and then I joined Columbia University, then I had to join Columbia University Astronomy and Physics Department postdoc fellowship at GIS, along with uh, some of my fellow postdocs, a guy named Jim Hansen, who you may have heard of as well. Go way back with him. Okay, okay. now initially, I was into all kinds of fun things, okay, before JASTRO, the head of the lab, got to me. So I did an eclipse expedition, I got some neat memorabilia. Uh, Jastrow actually let me take his invitation to watch uh, Apollo 17 go off. So I was there present in the VIP thing. My, my son was 10 years old at that point. Peter uh, accompanied me. Children under the age of 14 were not permitted, but that rule was only for people like, uh, you know, the. Uh, Prince of Bahrain, okay, stuff like that. They wanted the NASA kids there, so it was a shame. So when you go up and you say, oh, he's too young, go to trail of such and such, they loaded the kids out on a bus. They had the audacity, I didn't know this, uh, well, fortunately my wife didn't either. They actually took that busload of kids, put them in front of the blockhouse, you know, within like a mile of where the thing lifted off, because they knew this was going to be the last uh, mission to the moon. They, they were realists and so on. Uh, and it got delayed. I was really quite nervous because it was supposed to take off like at 9 or 10. It didn't take off till 2 in the morning. And uh, there was, in, in this area, there were all kinds of weird people, including George Wallace in a wheelchair accompanied with uh, a, a Miss Alabama pushing the wheelchair. Okay. So it, it was kind of an interesting experience. I was glad I did it. But, but the liftoff was magical. The skies lit up, it became daytime. It was the only nighttime launch, really late nighttime launch during the Apollo series. And 
somehow I met up with him. But to show you what the Halcyon days of NASA were like, you know, I had Jastrow's invitation, I fly down, I get there, I'd made an economy car reservation, uh, go to the things, oh, you're with NASA? You know, down, down to, I guess it must have been Orlando. We draw. I said, yeah, okay, I'm down here to see the launch. Said, oh, no, no, you can't have that. I said, so they gave me a brand new Cadillac convertible. Okay. I go to the uh, motel where I got, you know, the government rate room, which probably is right next to the boiler or whatever. And I said, are you with NASA? And I said, yeah, 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 she has with NASA. Okay, you know, no, you can't go to that. We, they gave me a, a poolside villa, okay, with the kid. And then they say, uh, you're going to come, I said, oh, no, I, where can I go for breakfast? I would, you know, want to go down. So no, 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 we'll give you breakfast included. So, so uh, everyone was completely enraptured with NASA. That they felt that by doing anything, they were contributing to the space program. Of course, I had nothing to do with, with that. I was just a happy observer. Okay. We're doing good. From gifts to go. The one thing I'm going to miss is EO1, which is fine. Okay. This is more interesting, I'm sure, for you. Uh, from gifts to Goddard, these are things I've been involved with over the years. LACI, Large Area Crop Inventory Experiment. AgriStars is a successor. I met uh, J Jastrow in the early 70s, around 72, when I first got on board, said, get some Earth Resources money. And I met Bill Stoney, and, uh, and, and somehow we got involved. Uh, at first, uh, the people down at Houston were kind of uh, very suspect of us, because they did have their own group. With Purdue and Iram were very heavily involved. But GIS got accepted after a while. We did good, good stuff. We had good people. I had uh, Sam Goward was my postdoc after I got on board. And uh, he had a number of students there. You, you met one, one of them, Cynthia Rosenzweig, uh, who gave a talk a few weeks ago. Joe Suskind was, I guess, with us, uh, although he didn't work in my particular group. And then um, descendants of Sam Goward here, uh, intellectuals, like Fred Hummer, who's right there in the audience, was his postdoc, as was Daryl Williams, you know, my branch head. And when I came down here in uh, 91, I, I, I'd been GS-15 for some wa while, and it was a sore point with him, because he, at that point, had not gotten his 15 yet. He was just GS-14. And he said, well, you know, she, it's not that he was going to tell me. I had to report to him administratively. He had to do my review. Well, he says, you have a problem with that? And I said, absolutely not, Daryl. Don't even think about it. Don't even worry about it. But just remember that your, your, your advisor was my postdoc. <laughs> That's all I had to say. It was funny. So then there was the algorithm development we did at GIS, supported by the... Uh, money in AgriStore's Landsat definition team. I was very involved with that. GIS Airborne Spectrometer, uh, which was kind of the forerunner of an instrument that rivaled what Alice Getz was doing. Uh, had a relationship with Dartmouth and Krell, the soil moisture measurements. Then all hell broke loose. There was somebody here at Goddard who felt that New York was unsafe and he wanted GIS to come down. It's about the same time that Jastro was investigated by the IG. Uh, a number of us were in the middle of that investigation and were being intimidated uh, for a variety of reasons. But they were, the intimidation was a mechanism for getting us to spill the beans. There were no beans to spill. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he was not, he was careless, <laughs> like some politicians we know, but not for personal gain. Okay. But at that point, H Hansen took over the labs and had to change his habits. His, he was a nocturnal person and came in at 6.30 in the morning the, just to make sure everything went all right and he saved the lab. And I was ordered down here and I came down here for a while. Uh, then I had to choose between staying down here or losing my family, okay, because they weren't moving, okay. And so I applied for and got a leave of absence over the objections of the human resources here. I spoke to uh, you know, usually people who seem to be uh, trying to encumber things like our legal group and so on, they're usually the best people to turn to if you go to them and say, I don't want to do that. You say, uh, this is my situation. Tell me what I can do. And Larry Watson said, that's illegal. He can't do that. Okay. 
Uh, I was backed up by uh, Vince Thomas, who was division chief, was in my corner at that time. Uh, the branch head was not, and the director was not, the directorate guy wasn't. But at any rate, I did get my leave of absence. I had three choices, Le Mans Geophysical Observatory, directly across the river from Hudson Labs, uh, US Military Academy at West Point, that would have only been a nine-month appointment, but I would have gotten a house up there, but I was in almost a commute distance because I lived in, uh, up in the Hudson Valley. Or IBM, T.J. Watson, IBM Labs. And I elected that, and there were five Nobel laureates there at the time. Okay. Uh, so it was a great experience. They were there for a year. They are primarily interested in medical imaging. And by the time um, that ended and I, I was, had to return to civil service at the end of my year of leave of absence, it turns out that the director was uh, kicked upstairs, okay? became an assistant to the director of the center. And Vince Selmanson aspired to directorship. And he says, Steve, you know, welcome back. Don't worry about a thing. He said, we'd love to have you down here, but you come when you're ready, when your family's ready. You just go to get but you will report to, to uh, you know, ultimately it was Charlie Schnetzler. Uh, but Bob Murphy was uh, acting at that, uh, was, was the guy who preceded, no, he didn't precede Charlie, I guess, I don't know who it was, because Charlie had left, and it was, uh, it was Jim Smith for a while, yeah. my, my good buddy. Anyway, so, so, just take another minute to, Watson's Fife, first this will skip field experiment. This is very interesting. It's a triple nested algorithm. It's the uh, Fife information system, and Fife is the first Isselskip field experiment. And Isselskip is an international satellite land climatology project. Is that right? Yeah, I got it. Wow. The, I did very little. I was uh, basically uh, with, 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 I, I was back at GISS, even though you know this was afterward, just before I came down, and. Uh, Fred Humrich and Dave Landis, who are here now, were, were basically uh, uh, the, the guts of this thing. And the, pe the person who really oversaw what they did was an absolute lunatic whose name was Don Strebel, who I've lost contact with, but Fred still, Fred still has contact with him. But I was the nominal project scientist, I guess, because they needed a civil service. That's what peers needed. Now, in Fife, peers conned me into doing a number of things. Okay. First of all, uh, I worked with the guys at Dartmouth and Krell, Coal Regions Research and Electronic, the US Army Corps of Engineers. So uh, they were very interested in soil moisture. Not for the reasons we are. They wanted to know about tractability of moving tanks and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, so there was this big wall, and I handed it to them, and they threw it over the wall. Okay. Uh, and uh, so the Dartmouth guys developed a soil impedance probe, and uh, I went across the cons of making these non-destructive measurements of uh, soil moisture, and volumetric, not gravimetric, and that was very, very important because that's what the uh, L-band microwave radiometer saw, the, the, the total you know, amount of weight, not, not, not the weight because the, the uh, bulk density just drops out of it if you just measure it directly. So I did that, I did these transects. And then at other times when I wasn't doing it, I was on the C-130, which was flying low because a guy named Jim Wang, I guess was his name, was hanging out the back. The door was open the car with the uh, radiometer and uh, make, making these measurements. And I was operating the mass. It's the first time Mike, Mike's instrument was uh, off of the airplane. And so uh, he... Um, but basically, I, I was doing those measurements as well. And then finally, well, the three. So I'm going to, okay. So I'm going to skip Corex, which was uh, 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 Tristan Russia, Boreas, you know about. So uh, recently, MODIS, I was in, involved with calibration. That's how I got involved with that. Parallel and data system, EO1, COs, and GEO, and IEEE. Now I'm going to stop because. The next thing was going to be an overview of EO1, and that's just too involved. I'll just show you this particular one, which just shows you the degree of involvement I had. That was at 2 a.m. in the morning before it went. I was really hands-on. That's my, that's my satellite. That's the way I feel about it in my ship. Okay. 
Now I'm going to go to the very end here. There's some neat pictures. And just close. You'll have to come to my EO1 talk. That's all there is to it. Okay. I didn't actually think I was going to get to this. There's one slide at the end I want to show you. Okay, there's still a crusade in cutting VO1. Well, we're about to lose it. And this is what precedes the mission. The most important part of the mission is getting the sticker and getting the wording right with the, with the help of people who are really getting weird about this. So these are all the different designs. We were asked to have a poster, Betsy, and because I was looking for one at that point, I came across all of these. But I'm coming to the one I like the best, and it's the one after this. <laughs> and it continues because of people like my granddaughter, actually it's her sister, I'm cheating a little bit, who had an uh, internship this summer at the NIH. Uh, and is uh, going to go into an exciting field. Okay, thank you for your time. <laughs>